So welcome back to part two of module two, the web, the big eye internet, the interwebs, whatever you want to call it, I'm pretty much good with it. Because after the last part of this in part one, you did learn the difference between the internet and the World Wide Web. And if you don't understand that, I would encourage you to go back and check that out. So in part two, we're going to discover or look at and identify the types of websites that are available. Explain the pros and cons of web apps, what it means to be a web app versus, say, an embedded smartphone app. Identify the major components of a web page, and then identify what it means to interact with secure and insecure, unsecure, not insecure, but unsecure web pages. So identifying types of web pages. We use web pages and websites for a ton of different things. You know, banking and finance, my U.S. bank site blogs that you read, bookmarking, business sites, e-commerce sites. So eBay is an e-commerce site. Now we'll get into more detail of the difference between an eBay site versus an Amazon site. But those are e-commerce sites, educational sites like coCC.edu, or some might even say that Blackboard is an educational site. I would say Blackboard is actually an educational web service. So Blackboard, Moodle, all those kind of things. Entertainment, well, Netflix rings a bell. Amazon Prime Video rings a bell. You know, health and fitness, information and security, mapping, Google Maps, MapQuest, media sharing, YouTube is a great example. Online social networks, so uh, anybody heard of Facebook? Facebook is one. LinkedIn is another. Now, we, we've already discovered the idea that LinkedIn is an online social networking site for Professions are for professional networking. Search sites, Google, Bing, Yahoo, all those good sites. Retails and auctions, we can get into that. You know, we will get into that. So let's just move on. Explain the pros and cons of web apps. Well, when we talk about web apps, those are applications that run entirely in a browser. They reside on a service on the internet instead of on the computer or mobile device. So Realize that some of the apps that you're downloading on your mobile device, your iPad, your phone, et cetera, may in fact be a web app. It is not, <coughs> excuse me, it is not just solely held on your phone. What that means is that I need to be connected to the internet to get the information. So my banking site is clearly a web app. If I'm not connected to the internet, then my banking site does not work. It doesn't contain all the information from my account within my phone, okay? So some apps can run traditional installed apps, which means the whole app is installed, but web apps need the internet connection in order to function. Examples, Dropbox, Skype, Microsoft Office Online, for example, would be, or Office 365 would be a web app, Whereas Microsoft Office downloaded to my computer, to my tablet, that's going to be an embedded app or an app that is installed on my device. So pros, well, access web apps for any device with a browser, which means simply put, since I'm doing it on a browser, it doesn't matter if I'm on a Windows device, an Android device, a Mac, Unix, Linux, it won't matter as long as I have a compatible browser application installed. We can collaborate with others, store your work in, you know, in, a, in an app's website. So if you're storing files up at OneDrive, for example, or a Google Drive, we can share those. We can work collaboratively through those platforms where I could create this PowerPoint and then someone in China, for example, could go ahead and review it, update it, and make changes to it. It certainly saves on storage space, et cetera. Just a few of the cons. Files are more vulnerable because of security. We hear about these hacks all the time, you know, where people's private data, you know, two million people lost private data or private data for them was revealed due to a Facebook hack or due to a Windows flaw, whatever the case may be. If the web app provider has technical issues, well, it's gonna be down. So if the web app provider goes out of business, you can lose your files. So if you're doing Quicken, for example, not that I expect into it to go out of business, but if all of my financial data is up on Quicken online or, or 
um, QuickBooks Online, for example, and they go out of business, it could seriously hurt. So we looked at the basics of a web page. We looked at the header, uh, I'm sorry, the address bar. We looked at the basic navigation. Now let's go in and look at what it means to be a website or a web page and the different components. So on the right here, you'll see that normally a web site or web page has a header. There's that CSS, Cascade Style Sheets, JavaScript, and then metadata. Now what's interesting is the second component, the navigation. Traditionally, we used to see navigation up at the top, and that's because that's what matched our computer with the file, save, etc. But now navigation is moved over to the left or via a drop down, for example. So let me see if I might get this to play. And what you'll notice here is the navigation on Amazon, some sub navigation is done via that little bar up there, the three bars that tells me that's navigation. There's more navigation besides the horizontal navigation that you sort of see on that. I apologize that I couldn't make that bigger. Then we have the base content. So that's where we see in our example here, hi, Eric. So we're looking at my customized Amazon page. Yes, I watch Wyatt or what can I say? Yes, the most recent book I reviewed was Linux Essentials. And then we can have a sidebar, and that sidebar can remain static with things that we want the reader to see all the time. Or it may be that the sidebar content is where we put ads. So on a regular website, and you might think of it right here, this might be some sidebar content where some Amazon customers, or maybe B2B, business to business, which we'll be talking about, Amazon businesses that do business through Amazon are advertising with Amazon. And we'll look at that in the next part. So we have our content. This content, by the way, is the body. It's the main content area. We have the sidebar and then finally the footer. And the footer tends to be that static information that we want on every web page. So that might be the how to contact us. It's definitely going to be the copyright information for our web page and anything else we might want the reader to be able to get to on a regular basis. Finally, we're gonna look at securing websites. It is hugely important. We hear about hacks each day where hundreds of millions or hundreds of thousands or thousands of credit cards, credit card information is stolen, user data is stolen. We wanna make sure to do our part. So. Excuse me. I apologize. I have a tickle in my throat. Or maybe it's a frog. Who knows? Anyway, we want to make sure that when we're putting personal identifiable information, PII, over the internet, that that information is leaving our computer and is scrambled, encrypted, and then de encrypted on the other end. This way, we can make sure that any connection that's made on the Big Eye Internet that may be monitoring this data is not going to be able to read it in plain or clear text. Okay, this is where in your browsers you want to be looking for the HTTPS. And you may even find sites like your website where, of course, uh, not website, but email, where an email site is HTTPS so that you know when you're sending an email, it's encrypted back to the email server. And then it's going to be encrypted when the person, if they're utilizing HTTPS, Hypertext Transfer Protocol Secure, if they're utilizing that on their end, that that data is also going to be secure. We use digital certificates that identify. So here's you know the HTTPS. We want to make sure, by the way, going back, we look for that lock. We can also call up the digital certificate behind that lock, usually by clicking on the lock and find out who issued the certificate, how long it's good for, what amount of encryption is being used. So a little hard to see down here, but you'll notice that this site is using 2048-bit encryption algorithm to encrypt the data. 
that means that in order for somebody to read this, they would have to figure out what that encryption key is, and that key is comp comprised of 2,048 ones and zeros, and in a lot of cases, those are randomly created just for the session. So if I log into my bank, I'm using one encryption. If I log out and log back in, I'm going to use a whole new key for that next session. So we definitely want to be looking for that lock icon. We want to make sure that we're using HTTPS. We want to go once in a while and look at these digital certificates to make sure they were issued to a company that's legit. Just because somebody has HTTPS, they could have got a simple certificate from GoDaddy, for example. We want to make sure that the companies that we're working with are legit. So I just want to quickly take a minute and look at how this works. So let's say we create a document like a Microsoft Word or Word processing document. It is in clear text. Anybody that brings it up can read it. So what we would do is we'd take all those ones and zeros and we'd encrypt them. So we use a key, we'd scrimble them up, and we would encrypt them. So as it transfers over the Big Eye Internet, it looks like garbly goop. And we do that with a key called a public key. Okay. Then on the other end, when we're ready to decrypt so that we can in fact read the message, we use the other part of the key, okay, which is the private key. So public private key, that's what we're looking at. Unsecure websites still exist today. It does not have the indicator of the lock. We're going to see the HTTP. And a lot of times, folks, like today, if you go out to certain websites and you type in HTTP, like Facebook, it's going to forward you to an HTTPS site so that they're making sure that your data is safe and it's encrypted as it traverses the Internet. So I think that's enough for this lesson. On the next part, part three, we're going to take a look at e-commerce. The role of e-commerce in daily life, most likely you've done some Amazon shopping or online shopping. We'll look at that. We'll look at business transactions. So we're going to look at what's called B2B, business to business transactions over the internet, business to consumer, consumer to consumer, like eBay. Maybe I don't have a business, but I've got some things to sell. Craigslist is another great example. Using e-commerce for personal transactions, <laughs> we all do that a lot today. Again, I apologize. I'm going to have to go drink some tea. Take care. I'll see you in the next one.